Okay, y'all, I'm going to cover three big ticket items here about X-Ray 2 production and interactions. Uh, these are major and significant foundational uh, components of how CT works. Um, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can and touch on all the information that's going to be important for us moving forward. Three essential conditions have to be met in order to produce X-rays. Um, this comes from our textbook on page 147, the reading from chapter 9. Um, number one, there must be a free source of, of, of electrons. Uh, two, we need to have a means of accelerating those electrons uh, to speeds approaching the speed of light, so quick acceleration, and then a means of very quickly decelerating those electrons as well. So the first thing that we're going to do in order to efficiently produce x-rays is we're going to create a glass envelope or a vacuum where we've removed any uh, air or other uh, gaseous particles that could interact with the electrons and slow down their movement. Um, then we are going to boil off electrons and we're going to do that by having number one a high, uh, high frequency generator. So the very first step to determining a range of CT techniques is to have a good generator, right? We need a good source of, of stable power. And we will run a portion of that power into a negatively charged section that we're going to, going to call the cathode. And it has a filament right here. Um, and that filament boils off electrons. It produces an electron beam. And then on a positively charged side, which we are going to call the anode, um, on this positively charged side, we're going to have a rotating anode that spins very rapidly, and it is made of a high, uh, high atomic number uh, element, typically tungsten and molybdenum, um, and it spins in order to displace heat. So the electrons are going to be um, accelerated across the space from the, an the cathode to the anode, um, because of the potential difference between the negative and the positive charge. And they're going to jump and accelerate very quickly across the vacuum, slam into that anode target, and in the process uh, produce x-rays as well as a whole lot of heat. Most of what the x-ray tube produces um, is heat, infrared light, um, as well as regular old visible light. So the anode will literally start to glow white hot um, which is one of the reasons why we rotate the anode um, very rapidly um, uh, while we're making the x-rays. So um, we're still within the x-ray tube as we consider this slide here and this is the first and I would say the most important form of x-ray production within the tube is Bremster lung radiation production um, and it comes directly from the de rapid deceleration of the projectile electrons by the um, high uh, atomic number target, the tungsten target. So you can see this element that is decelerating the path of the electron is a very large element. Um, and as the electron decelerates, the arc of its deceleration determines the energy of the x-ray that's produced. So if we have a fairly um, uh, low trajectory change, so in this case over here it doesn't bend all that much, um, the energy that's produced is a low energy Bremster lung x-ray versus this um, side over here in the second part, um, it has a huge change of its direction and so we have a high energy Bremster lung x-ray that results. Bremster lung is just a fancy German word for stopping. I want to stress again that this is a particulate um, interaction between electrons and tungsten atoms um, that happens within the x-ray tube. It does not happen inside the patient. Uh, it does not happen in any place other than uh, within the x-ray tube with the conditions that are provided uh, through that high potential energy in the vacuum. The other form of x-ray production that occurs within the x-ray tube um, does involve uh, ionization. So the uh, projectile electron uh, ionizes uh, the tungsten atom, so it knocks a, an electron out of the uh, electron valence shell, and that can occur at any um, of the valence shells. We'll look at that here in just a minute. Um, and what happens is a, these electrons are lazy, and so the, they want to move closer to the atom because that means that they're going to be held more closely, almost like you can think about it's a stronger, like a hug. 
that they're receiving from the nucleus. And so they, they're pulled closer into that hug from the nucleus, and as a result, they give off a secondary energy. And we call it characteristic because it's going to be characteristic of the electron binding energy at that level. So energy can ne neither be created nor destroyed, and in the process of dropping down to that lower energy level, they're going to give off energy characteristic of that level. So what it's going to result in is very interesting spikes in energy. So I want to mention again the the characteristic x-ray production the reason it's x it is characteristic is because it's a characteristic of the element that produces the um, the photon so this is a tungsten target uh, K shell binding energies and if you look at the K shell level we have two potential electrons if one of those were to be ionized its binding energy is 69 um, so the x-ray that would be resulted from the loss of that electron um, is going to be 69 as well, 69 keV, kilo electron volts. You can see that um, there's a precipitous drop-off in energy from the K shell to the L shell. So in terms of uh, diagnostic uses of x-rays, 69 keV is diagnostically useful, 12 keV is not. Um, and so we are only concerned with the K-shell electron ejection for characteristic x-ray production as a form of diagnostic x-rays. Are other x-rays produced f through characteristic effect? Yes, they are. And that is one of the reasons why we filter um, the x-ray tubes to keep those low energy x-rays from reaching the patient because a 12 keV uh, x-ray photon is only going to ionize the patient's skin. It has no diagnostic value. Another way of thinking about that is as a spectrum. Bremsstrahlung provides us a continuous spectrum of energies, um, everything from just above zero to whatever the set um, KVP or kiloelectron uh, peak was uh, set by the technologist. So in CT, as we're when we set a KVP um, for the uh, X-ray tube as we're producing the images. Um, everything is being produced up to that level. If you can think about it as like a rainbow of energies that are being produced, if we're able to see what's exiting the x-ray tube, we would see a spectrum of different um, energies. And uh, everything up to the maximum that we set. And you can see the majority of the x-rays that are being produced at this KVP of 95 or what have you um, are nowhere close to 95. Um, but then we also have, so this would be a continuous spectrum for the Bremsstrahlung. Over here with the characteristic x-rays, we have what's called a discrete spectrum. It means that the x-rays are only being produced at that electron binding energy of 69. And so we just have a single a discrete spike right here. Now, if this, if this chart was accurate, we would also, like we know, see discrete spikes here around um, 12 KeV and other lower energies that would also be characteristic x-ray spikes but again we're going to filter those x-rays out. So now we're going to move we're exiting the x-ray tube with the photons the good x-rays that we've produced the diagnostic quality x-rays that we've produced um, within the x-ray tube we have exited the tube now and we are moving towards the patient as high energy photons right and as we interact inside the patient's body, um, there's going to be uh, two major important interactions that occur that are influential to uh, the diagnostic spectrum of energies and have influenced the images that we receive. The first, um, but I do want to mention real quickly, coherent scatter. Um, it is not necessarily... Uh, this is generally lower energy photons that coherent scatter occurs with, and you can see there's no ionization that occurs. So where we might see this in diagnostic imaging would be imaging protocols like those used in MAMO or perhaps dental x-ray, um, where we have a fairly low energy photon, interacts with the nucleus of the atom, and continues off at a different direction. It did not ionize the atom. This does occur to some degree um, in within the patient during CT scanning. So it is out there, a coherent scatter is part of it, but generally most of these photons are gonna be absorbed somewhere within the patient's body and be attenuated. The big two that I'm most concerned with are Compton scatter and photoelectric effect. So we've already discussed them to some degree, perhaps in group me um, or in class, but with Compton scatter, the significant thing that occurs here, we have an incident X-ray photon 
ionizes the atom and it will produce a Compton electron or uh, sometimes it's called a recoil electron. And then a, another photon is going to be produced. So that's lambda dash here on the right. And it will have some angle of deflection and it can be any angle possible. It, it, we would call it isotropic in production. It can happen in any direction. Um, and so this sometimes is called modified scattering or incoherent scattering because it could go off in any possible direction. So what's the problem with that? Well, number one, it's ionized the patient. Coherent scatter, it just interacted with the atom and scattered and went in a different direction. This one ionized the patient, so there's a potential that it could cause some biological damage. Plus, it's produced a second photon that's moving in a different direction. So it is now lying to our detector software and telling us that there's information where there's not actually any information. Um, it's, it's, it's a form of noise, if you will. It's almost like television static. Photoelectric effect, by contrast, is our friend. We really like photoelectric effect, and I want to stress that without photoelectric effect, there would not be a diagnostic range of energies. Um, I've had students that have been unclear about that in the past. The reason for this is that the incident x-ray photon, um, it, it ionizes the atom uh, and it can ionize any shell, any electron valence shell within the atom, but generally within the structures of the human body, um, it generally will be a K-shell electron that will be ionized. Um, and the ejected electron we'll refer to as a photoelectron and it fully attenuates or stops the x-ray photon. So all of the energy of the photon is given off to the production of the photoelectron. And what this means is that this photon will not expose the image receptors or the data collection uh, systems that we have. Um, so uh, this is important because, because of the stopping of the photon, we're able to see different levels of contrast that's directly tied to atomic number and tissue density and linear attenuation coefficients, which are all very, very important to CT. And we'll be talking about all of those things um, quite a bit this trimester. So um, we generally lump all of that uh, in within a notion of differential absorption. And this is a major part of how image production occurs. Now I wanna uh, point out one thing that Compton scatter uh, actually, and we've discussed this some in the discussion boards, but Compton scatter, again, like we mentioned, could happen in any direction, and we've said that if it does reach the image receptor, it's going to produce noise, but it also potentially can be our number one occupational dose, is actually scatter coming off of the patient. So the patient, as a CT tech, is our number one health hazard, if you will, is going to be Compton scatter, back scatter coming off of the patient. But if it scatters in a way that doesn't reach the image receptor, um, it's similar in that we still have a differential absorption that has occurred. Um, photoelectric absorption we like because it's nice and clean. Um, and then there's going to be some photons that have sufficient energy to just pass straight through the patient without any interactions occurring whatsoever um, to just possibly influence the uh, image receptor itself. And between those photons that are absorbed, particularly through photoelectric absorption, and those photons that are transmitted through the patient to the image receptor, that is how we receive image data. So the factors of affecting differential absorption are a higher atomic number. So this is one of the reasons why we use things like positive contrast agent, is it increases the atomic number of uh, like blood vessels and things like that. Um, so photoelectric absorption increases as we have an increasing higher Z number. Um, Compton effect, which is, this is a nice thing, God smiled on us this day, is unaffected by Z number. Um, so photoelectric effect is, Compton isn't. As we increase the KVP, um, photoelectric absorption will start to decrease sharply and scatter um, starts to be the proportionally greater interaction that occurs. This means that there is a ceiling to the diagnostic range of energies. And generally the ceiling is taken to be about 120 kVp. We do not set energies much higher than that. And the reason for that is because as we start to increase the energy level past that, we start to get more and more scatter, so more and more static on the image and less and less actual useful information. Um, and then also as we increase uh, patient mass density, 
photoelectric absorption will increase, but the problem is Compton scatter also increases. So these are those um, obese patients who we're trying to scan and we're having a fall off of both photoelectric absorption um, and we're also seeing an increase in scatter due to the patient's mass. Thank you. Um, I thought this was an interesting picture. Uh, you can look it up on NPR, but uh, they did a survey of uh, radiologists looking at, I think they were low energy lung scans and tried to see how many of them missed the gorilla that's right here. Have a good one.